The coastline of North East Yorkshire forms the eastern boundary of the North Yorkshire Moors National Park, so the visitor will expect that nature has provided some spectacular coastal scenery. And indeed she has. There is probably no better place to view some of this from the scattered collection of houses which form the clifftop village of Ravenscar, approximately midway between the much better known resorts of Scarborough and Whitby. Just over a century ago, there were great plans for Ravenscar, and today it is known by many as the town that never was. However, the history of the area can be traced back much further. The view from here, looking north over Robin Hood's Bay, reveals a landscape which, although scratched by man over many centuries, remains essentially unchanged since the dinosaurs roamed the earth some 180 million years ago. This whole coast, from Stays in the north to Flamborough in the south, has been designated as Yorkshire's Jurassic Coast and is rich in fossils. About 120 million years ago, the cliffs of the coast were formed by an earthquake uplifting the sea floor. It is not too difficult to imagine dinosaurs roaming and foraging on the rocks below. There are actual footprints at Whitby and here in 1960 at the base of the cliffs below a geology student from Manchester discovered a fossilised plesiosaur, a long-necked coast living marine reptile estimated to have lived some 180 million years ago. What follows is an account of the excavation led by Dr Fred Broadhurst. Students from Manchester University were studying the geology of the Yorkshire coast at Ravenscar, North Yorkshire, when they spotted the tip of something interesting projecting from rocky shore. After a little more excavation, the head, neck and one paddle-shaped arm of a plesiosaur were revealed. The fossil was at an angle to the surface, which meant the body and tail were much deeper than the head. Fred quickly realised the rest was too deep and they would have to return to complete the excavation. He led the group of six research students who worked for two days in appalling weather conditions with driving sleet and hail. The plesiosaur was recorded in detail before being carefully removed in three large blocks. The fossil turned out to be one of the most complete plesiosaurs ever discovered Detailed research shows that this fossil is a new species recently classified as Halphiosaurus thomis tomimus. Scientists from around the world continue to study this unique specimen. Archaeological evidence suggests that the first human settlers would have been semi-nomadic people during the early Bronze Age. Around 2500 BC, some areas became ritually important to these Beaker people. The concentration of standing stones Calf stones, barrows and tumuli in the close proximity indicate that these high moors were such a site. In September 2003, a large moorland fire destroyed 
all the heather cover of this area. Many previously undiscovered stone carvings were exposed for the first time for many centuries and gave researchers a bonanza of new finds. Over the next 2000 years Celtic tribes took over and by the time of the Roman invasion in 43 AD the Brigantes were the dominant tribe of the area. The Roman occupation of Britain lasting until 410 AD was not a peaceful one. They were under constant attack from both within and the raiders from abroad. Around 370 AD they built five signal forts along the coast from Firely in the south to Huntcliffe in the north, with small repeater beacons in between. They were built overlooking beaches where possible raiders could land. The central one was Ravenscar and its foundations were discovered during the excavations to build Peak House, now the Raven Hall Hotel, in 1774. They also found another fascinating artefact that now resides in Whitby Museum. It is a stone that bears the inscription Justinian, Governor of the Province and Vendicianus, Prefect of Soldiers, built this fort. The square stone forts, all the same pattern, would have been about 20 metres high within a curtain wall. In the event of an invasion, they would have been able to signal troops to repel the invaders. They were not occupied long, and as the Romans retreated, were left to be looted by Anglo-Saxon and Norse raiders. Over the next 600 years or so the area was settled by these raiders and the Roman forts were plundered and dismantled to provide stone for their dwellings. These would not have been constructed at the top of cliffs as the site is exposed to the elements, but in sheltered and wooded areas below. Christianity came to Whitby with the foundation of St Hilda's Monastery around 657 AD and lasted until Vikings destroyed it some 200 years later. But it is just possible that the mainly Norse settlers around Ravenscar would have been unaware of these events. The Norman invasion of 1066 finally united the nation bringing with it a nationwide government of sorts, the land being allocated and controlled by Norman knights who had helped conquer the land. The Doomsday Book of 1086 does not mention Ravenscar. The nearest place described is Filing Old Hall. For the next 500 years, Ravenscar would remain virtually untouched by man until the area became the centre of Britain's first major chemical industry, the manufacture of alum. Alum was a colour fixative used in the dyeing of cloth and its production was controlled by the Papal States. When King Henry VIII wanted to divorce Catherine of Aragon and marry Anne Boleyn, the supply of alum to England was cut off.
Thomas Challoner of Gisborough Hall had discovered alum in North Yorkshire in the early 1600s, and in 1606 James I granted him the monopoly to produce it. In 1615, alum was discovered on this site by Sir Brian Cook of Wheatley, Doncaster. Production commenced and finally ceased here in 1862. The process of making alum is long, dirty and complex, involving vast quantities of shale, large amounts of coal to burn it, and also, of all things, human urine. Getting the coal and urine to the site was achieved by sea. Coal was brought from Newcastle and the ships collected the alum and sailed on to deliver it to London then the centre of the textile trade. The ships returned with urine collected from the streets of London in barrels and unloaded them to be carted or dragged up the cliff to the Allen Works. There were other works along this northeast coast of Yorkshire but these at Ravenscar are the best preserved. The National Trust, since it acquired the site in 1971, made it more accessible and much more information is available from them regarding this fascinating industry. Today it is hard to believe that all this happened in such an isolated location. During the life of the Allen Works of some 250 years, it remained in the ownership of the Cook family, but was leased out to various people. In 1763, a Captain William Childs of London acquired the works, and as mentioned earlier, had Peak House built in 1774. The stench on his front lawn when the wind was in the wrong direction must have been appalling. He died in 1829 and the hall passed to his daughter Anne Willis, whose husband's family had prospered from treating George III for his madness. Her son, the Reverend Dr Willis, was a gambler who swiftly lost the family fortune and Mr William Hammond acquired the hall in 1845. Throughout his life he had observed the rise of the railways and when the Scarborough to Whitby Railway was proposed he, as a director of the building project, insisted on a tunnel on his land. He unfortunately died three months before the railway opened so failed to see his project completed and a train emerging from the tunnel. But the railway, opened in July 1885, brought with it for the first time visitors to this isolated part of the coast. On the death of Mr Hammond's widow in 1890, his four daughters inherited the estate and their trustees sold it to the Peak Estate Company in 1895. They had big plans. Peak House was extended, converted and renamed the Raven Hall Hotel. This station was renamed Ravenscar. Hundreds of men set about laying out the streets and drains for this new holiday destination. 
In 1898, the golf course was completed. The sales brochure of 1900 tells of hanging gardens and terraces. Maps show the various plots available and indeed, though some were sold, as we can see today, very few were actually built upon. In the event, the company went into liquidation in 1913. So, why did this new town fail? On a fine summer's day it is Elysium, but at other times it can be Tartarus, particularly in winter, with a northeasterly cutting you in half. Access to the shore is by a tortuous cliff path down the 600 foot cliffs and when reached there is no beach only rocks this was not the resort town the brochure attempted to portray in addition there were no industries although the Whittaker Brick Company opened the brickworks on the site of the old alum quarry in 1900 through which the new railway ran on its way north to Robin Hood's Bay. The bricks were intended to build the new town. They were all inscribed with the name Ravenscar and can still be found today. Production ceased in the early 1930s and the works were demolished in the 1960s. Today the brick kiln is still recognisable but greatly overgrown. The railway, which was to have brought prosperity to the area, continued until 1965 its halcyon days being during the 1930s. Tourists loved the line for its spectacular views and today cyclists and walkers can still enjoy them. It is now just over a hundred years since the town was abandoned and the streets have been reclaimed by nature. A few hundred yards south on the cliff edge is the Bentrick Coast Guard Lookout Station built in 1935.
During the war, it became a war watch station. It was connected by telephone to the radar station built just behind it. This consisted of the transmitter and receiving block, a generator room and fuel store, and nearer the railway were the accommodation and administration blocks, with only the foundation bases remaining today. In 1999, the coastal lookout station was restored as part of the Heritage Coast project. The visitor today can visit the National Trust Centre which provides a great deal of information about the area whilst refreshments can be obtained at the hotel. Having visited Ravenscar over the last 60 years it is a place that never fails to exert its mystical charm. For me and many others it is exemplified by this view, one of many you can enjoy from this windswept cliff-top hamlet of Ravenscar, the town that never was.